Hello, it's Thursday and uh, we're wrapping up week three. Um, before we get into the material for today, I just wanted to um, sort of direct your attention to a couple of things. So um, if you are watching this Thursday, um, which I, I hope that you are, um, your video project is due today. So on the uh, link between uh, deforestation and increase in human disease outbreaks, that is due today. Um, I haven't heard that anybody is having trouble, so I imagine everything is going swimmingly. Um, a few of you have already submitted it early. That's fantastic. Um, if you're still working on it or having some trouble, um, you know, do be in touch straight away and um, we can get that situated. Um, you will have a quiz coming up next week on material um, since the last quiz. So um, that'll be the same as the last one, open resource. And I encourage you to um, use external resources provided that you're citing um, the materials that you're using um, or indicating uh, individuals that you're choosing to collaborate with. Um, I think that's totally appropriate to you know, use each other as a resource. Um, but you know do make sure that you indicate that you've done that um because you know thing about teachers is we're super super good at noticing when um something looks like it you know maybe is similar or it's you know giving vibes of something else so just just let me know and you'll be you'll be fine um that'll open monday and you'll have a full week to complete it well a full uh course week to complete it so it'll be due uh next thursday so a week from today um, and then the last thing I want to bring to your attention is um, I am posting a um, just a short like Google form survey on conference periods, thinking about like how they're being used, how they can be used better, um, stuff like that. So if you would please just um, take that poll when you can, um, I'd really, really appreciate it. That information is really useful for me. Currently, we have four conference periods uh, per week that are being offered, um, but I'm, you know, we're three weeks in and I'm starting to notice some trends with those so um, if there uh, are ways that we can be using that time more effectively or differently um, I, I want to hear that so it's just a, it's like some sh like short yes no questions um, should take you less than five minutes but it would really really be helpful for me so please do that um, when you can so let's see here. Um, so we last time um, looked at the uh, anatomy and physiology of plants. So thinking about the different tissue types that we'll see in um, both monocots, so um, plants that uh, when they emerge from the from the seed when they've begun to germinate they have one cotyledon or um, baby like embryo embryonic leaf um, or dicots which uh, when they have germinated have two cotyledons so two of those little baby leaves um, if you've ever like done that um, that thing in middle school or just for fun at home where you've sprouted a little bean um, mon uh, beans are actually most species of beans at least are um dicots and so you'll see these like two little leaves that kind of have the shape of the bean and these exist for the purpose of um, being the first photosynthetic cells so that that little baby can can grow a little bit better um, we talked about a lot of other structures too um, the meristems where uh, new growth is accumulating we looked at um, roots as well which is what we'll be focusing on for this is um, the functionality of different components of the roots and uh, specifically how they uptake um, water and nutrients and so, uh, you know, looking back at this, this is what we saw last time. So this is just sort of like your general route. And so we've got, um, we've got three zones to the root. So we have um, the, the zone of cell division. So this is where the apical meristem is located. And so um, this is where new cells are dividing. This is the site of mitosis um, in a root. And so again, at the apical meristems, you know, this is at the um, tips of the shoots um, in that bud and then the tips of the roots. So cell growth is accumulating in this region and sort of pushing uh, the, the length up and so accumulating and creating uh, length in the, in the root that way. So we have a lot of growth here and um, that, that 
those new cells are going to accumulate here in this zone of elongation um, held together by cellulose fibers. Cellulose is a um, carbohydrate that makes up plant fibers. We'll talk more about that shortly, actually. And then as the cells mature and they begin to accumulate, they enter this zone of differentiation. This is when they become mature cells um, and they begin to develop root hairs as well. Now also seen here is what we call the root cap. And these are kind of like sturdy cells. Um, they are going to create a compound that's um, a little bit analogous to like human mucus that's going to help them go through the soil and that root cap is there to protect the um, apical meristem so those new baby cells are free to divide and and be protected as they're moving through the soil and so back to um back to this sort of zone of differentiation, what we can see clearly up here is this vascular cylinder. Um, and so the vascular cylinder contains the tissues xylem and phloem. And so xylem, remember, is going to be transporting our water and phloem is going to be transporting our sugars. And so I remember this like phloem has like an F sound, F for food, right? And so xylem doesn't really have uh, a cute acronym, or not acronym, uh, mnemonic like that. So if you think of one, let me know. I would love to hear it. Um, but so we've got the vascular cylinders here, and so this is in this is a bundle of um, the vascular tissues, xylem and phloem, and so they exist sort of positioned um, next to each other. We'll see um, why that's important shortly. And so this is running throughout um, the length of the root. Um, where it is able to um, collect and disperse uh, water and sugars respectively. And so then we also have these root hairs coming off of that. And so we can see that a little bit better here. The root hairs, interestingly, are actually just a projection of the cell. So if this is one of the cells lying more towards the inside, this is the adjacent cell that has the root hair. And so we can see that you know, the nucleus is positioned the same, the root hair is just a long sort of thread-like projection of cytoplasm encased in, um, uh, a long projection of cytoplasm with vacuole inside encased in cell wall. And so then if we look at a cross section, so we're just look, taking a couple different angles of this, um, we can see all of the layers. Um, I chose a dicot stem just because I like them, um, but we have all of these layers of the um, cell as well. well. We'll look at those in a little bit more detail shortly. So looking at this cross section here, remember that um, we have we have ground tissue, um, which I, I feel like I may not have said before, so I'm saying it now. Um, of ground tissue, what we have are three types. And so we have the parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma. And I don't think we've talked about the sclerenchyma or the colenchyma. Um, they are important, um, but I think we just may not have defined them um, as being types of ground tissue. So parenchyma, we talked about last time, um, this is our functional living tissue. So this is um, generally photosynthetic, active, um, vascularized, dividing, living tissue um, that's part of the plant. So this is going to include um, the sapwood, the cambium, if we're talking about um, something wooden. Um, this is going to include the pith right? And so the colenchyma um, is more of a structural tissue. So it more exists to maintain um, the structure and support of the organism. So these cell walls of the colenchyma cells are going to be um, a lot thicker. Um, they're going to generally be made of materials like cellulose, so a really thick layer of cellulose, that's that carbohydrate that makes up vegetable fibers, or they may also be made of another molecule called lignin. And so if you've been in my class before, you may remember whenever we see IN at the end of something, we're talking about a protein. And so um, the lig, 
also, if you remember DNA replication, you may have learned that this, this lig um, prefix is uh, like a shortened version of like ligate, um, which means to connect. And so you may have seen this before in the context of ligase, um, which is the enzyme that's going to join together um, the Okazaki fragments um, on the lagging strand during DNA replication. And so lignin is a, a protein that's actually responsible for like what we know as wood. And so whenever you see a tree, those cell walls are, you know, they may contain some cellulose, some percentage of cellulose, but primarily they're going to be made of um, this molecule called lignin. And so um, that's going to give that woody structure and make up the um, really thick cell walls of the cholenchyma. So the sclerenchyma is similar in some ways to the cholenchyma, so it's there for structural support. Um, this is the, these are the dead tissue cells um, that were part of the plant but are no longer living. They're no longer providing um, active uh, resources, active metabolic resources for the plant. And so this would be analogous to what we learned last time, which is like the heartwood. So this is like that dead internal um, uh, cell structure that's on the inside of the tree, that like core of the tree. And we would also call that, if we wanted to be, you know, specific scientists, we would say that this is sclerenchyma. And so going back to the root hairs also, we're just sort of defining all of our terms here and getting a good sense of um, what we're looking at anatomically. So I said that the root hairs are really just projections off of the cell. So it's like if you took the vacuole, the cytoplasm and the cell wall and you just like pinched off a strand of it and made it really long, that's what the root hair is going to be. And so it's there to increase the surface area of the cell so that it's better able to uptake um, things like minerals and water from the soil. Um, this really helps the plant out quite a bit in that way. And so it also, and so uh, specifically, it's going to facilitate the uptake of um, phosphorus here, abbreviated as P, and, and uh, nitrogen, abbreviated as N. The other thing that they're really useful for is um, they can be sort of latching on points for these organisms called mycorrhizae. And so mycorrhizae are a type of fungi, and so it's, um, it's sort of an umbrella term. It doesn't refer to a specific type of fungus, um, rather um, any number of different fungal species that have this job where they latch on to the root hairs of a plant and they latch on to the roots of a plant. And what they're doing is they are um, acquiring nutrients from the um, from the root. They're, they're acquiring nutrients from the plant, and so they're getting helped out that way. But then also they're helping the plant by increasing the surface area of the roots so that the plant is now even more effectively able to, um, in, to uh, absorb nutrients and water from the soil surrounding it. And so you may have seen this before. This looks kind of like this. So like this would be, well, it looks like this, sorry. But this would be the plant, um, you know, if you, if you pulled it up by the roots, this would be um, what it would look like without um, those mycorrhizae. And if we, but if we saw a plant that had mycorrhizae um, sort of latched onto those roots, I mean, it's pretty clear in this image that, what we're seeing is something that takes up a great deal more space. And so if it's better able to take up space, then it's better able to uh, potentially access nutrients and water in the soil. There's just more, um, there's, a, there's a wider reach for the plant, so it's better able to get the things that it needs. And so it's, you know, it's got its root hairs, it's got its mycorrhizae, it's, you know, set up to be the best it can. And ultimately, I mean, you know, it's going to uptake some water. Plants need water to survive. We kind of knew that going into this. And there's three pathways um, with which it can 
moving myself to get out of the way. Um, there's three pathways um, that water can enter the plant. So we have the apoplastic pathway, the symplastic pathway, and the vacuolar pathway. And so the vacuolar pathway is, um, wow, for real? Okay. <laughs> So the vacuolar pathway um, is largely useless. We mostly don't care about it. It's terribly inefficient. It accounts for a very small amount of the water that's um, passing through the plant, but essentially what's happening if you're interested is uh, water or we use the vacuole as sort of like the trash can storage site of the cell and so part of that is um, storing water and so water uh, diffuses essentially from vacuole to vacuole um, across cells through these spaces that we call the plasmodesmata. And so the plasmodesmata are um, or like the singular plasmodesma are um, little spaces um, where the, it's like a narrow bridge of cytoplasm um, that is going to facilitate the exchange of molecules um, between cells. And so this is really useful because this is how uh, adjacent cells are going to communicate with each other, but also how adjacent cells are going to share resources. Because if we go back um, just a little bit here, if we go back, we'll see that there are layers to cells, right? So this apical meristem is giving us new cells and they're not, it's not just one, you know, uniform layer. There's like multiple, um, there's multiple layers to that width wise. So we have um, a lot of space to get through if water is only being able to access the root from the external surfaces. It's got to get into those other cells um, and to the xylem uh, somehow. And so the way it does this is uh, in part through those, those passageways, those cytoplasmic bridges, um, the plasma desmata. And so essentially what's going to happen, um, let's start with the apoplastic pathway, um, which goes through the cell wall and is shown here in purple. And so the apoplastic pathway is um, going to, essentially the water is going to diffuse into the cell wall. And from there, it's going to travel towards the xylem. Uh, using only the cell walls as a passageway. And as you can see, this is fairly inefficient. I mean, it's got to go sort of around everything. It can't use the plasma desmata. Um, and then everything seems to be going mostly okay, though, until we reach this region called the Casparian strip. And so the Casparian strip is a uh, band of tissue that is um, most alike the cell wall material so it could be made up of uh, lignans, uh, cellulose, or um, another molecule called subinin. And so these, uh, these bands of tissue, this Casparian strip, is like a, like a waterproof band that sort of um, blocks the water from absorbing too quickly. And so the water has to pass um, the water has to pass the Casparian strip in order to get in, right? But since it's waterproof, it needs to go around it. Now you'll notice that the Casparian strip goes through the cell wall, but ends at the interior of the cell. So it does not cross the cytoplasm. And so this is important because what this means for the apoplastic pathway is that this water has been absorbing and traveling all through the cell walls. But by the time it reaches the Casparian strip, it has to then uh, diffuse into the cell. And this is thought to um, be a mechanism by which um, roots regulate their internal pressure, what we call turgor pressure. Um, that's spelled T-U-R-G-O-R, um, um, turgor pressure. And so this is the um, internal water pressure of a uh, plant cell. So that vacuole is like really, really full. And so when the um, 
when the plant cell is full of water, it's firm. And then when it uh, loses turgor pressure and loses water in that vacuole, it becomes uh, sort of limp and wilted a little bit. And so, but we don't want it to get too firm. We don't want too much water to be in there. And so this is thought to be um, potentially the role of the Casparian strip is saying essentially, okay, after a certain point, um, we are going to close the doorway by which water is capable of entering um, the xylem tissue, which will transport it throughout the plant. And so looking then at the symplastic pathway shown here in green, this is a lot more straightforward. So we have water that diffuses um, through the uh, cell wall, through, the, through maybe the root tissue, we'll say, um, or the root hair, sorry. Um, and so diffusing through the cell wall, diffusing into the cytoplasm, and from there it's going to essentially travel through the plasma desmata of each cell, each adjacent cell, um, until it reaches the endodermis. And then once it reaches the pericycle cell, we now have more plasma desmata by which water can enter. The pericycle is going to be the last layer of tissue that is adjacent to the xylem. And so from the pericycle, we're going to have the diffusion of water into the xylem tissue. And it does this um, through a process called osmosis. So um, it, this is hopefully something that was familiar to you going in, but um, just to ensure that we are all on the same page, um, we'll kind of quickly go over it also. Um, there is a video resource for this concept is, uh, posted as well in uh, yesterday, well, Tuesday's materials. Um, so I highly suggest you watch that if you're feeling at all shaky about understanding osmosis. So what osmosis specifically refers to is the passage of water across a semi-permeable membrane um, as a means to um, equalize concentration of solute. And so um, diffusion refers to the movement of solutes um, a, across a concentration gradient. So when I say a concentration gradient, I mean um, a gradient of uh, solutes. So could be like salt, sugar, another molecule. Um, so a gradient of solutes where at one part um, of the, we'll say, container. Um, at one portion of the container, the, the molecules are very highly concentrated. There's a lot of them in one space. And then as we go through, um, the, they gradually become less and less. And so diffusion is the process by which um, these solutes are going to move from an area where they are highly concentrated to an area where they are less concentrated until they are evenly dispersed throughout. And osmosis has a similar goal, but where diffusion refers to the movement of solutes, osmosis is referring specifically to the movement of water. And so if we've got a container here, right, we've got our fancy science speaker and uh, we divide it laterally and we say that, okay, this red line is a semi-permeable membrane. So um, semi meaning partially, um, permeable is like, um, like penetratable, um, able to pass through, it can permeate. And so, <clears throat> And so we have the um, low concentration on one side and on the other side of the semi-permeable membrane, we have a high concentration. And so the concentration is referring to um, how many molecules of solute we have present in that, um, in that liquid. And so on one side, it's a little bit less, on one side, it's higher. And so because this, um, this membrane is semi-permeable, what that means is that some things can pass through it, but others cannot. And so in the case of osmosis, the solute is not capable of uh, passing through the membrane, but the water is. And so this 
situation is not uh, chemically ideal. And so what any solution really wants, um, and this is just a, a property of physics really, is to be um, equalized. So, you know, uh, during diffusion, solute molecules are going to move where they are less concentrated in order to reach equilibrium. But because of this semi-permeable membrane, the solute molecules cannot move. So instead, what will happen is we're going to take some of this water and dilute the concentrate or dilute the solute on the other side until the concentrations are equal. So we are removing some of the solvent, some of the liquid that the solute is dissolved into and we are moving it to the other side um, so that the concentrations are equal. Um, and this, co this uh, concept gets really important when we're thinking about transpiration. Um, also, I learned how to put GIFs into uh, my PowerPoint, and I think that's really cool, and you can probably expect some more of those in the future. Um, so transpiration um, is actually the process by which the water um, that has been taken up by a plant um, is evaporating through the surface of the leaves. Specifically, it's going to um, be evaporating through the stomata. And so in intuitively, this sort of makes sense if we think about it, because if we have um, you know, an opening, you know, somewhere, that's going to be the space where um, a gas might be able to leave. And it also kind of makes intuitive sense because if we think about when we've seen water boil, like on the stove, the steam sort of rises up. So it makes sense that water would be taken up through the roots of a plant and then sort of move up to be evaporated out um, of an opening in the leaves. And so this is all possible um, due to uh, two properties of water called adhesion and cohesion. And so they're, uh, they sound similar, like they like um, auditorily sound similar. Um, so be cautious of mixing them up. Um, cohesion refers to the ability of water molecules to stick to each other. And this has to do with the fact that water is a polar molecule. And so if you remember from chemistry or potentially you've learned this in bio 100, I don't know if this is something that's taught in physics, um, but water is a polar molecule, meaning at, you know, if this is our water molecule, this big one, is, this big circle is the oxygen and these two smaller ones are the hydrogen. On the, uh, on the oxygen, we have a slight negative charge. And on the hydrogens, we have a slight positive charge. And so there, th this means that the molecules are able to interact um, with each other, forming weak attractive forces between one another, where the partial positive charge of one molecule attracts the partial negative charge of the adjacent molecule. And so this is the property of cohesion. Um, I think like cooperate, um, they like work, they like go together. Um, that's the mnemonic I use to remember it. Um, but then also this, I mean, this explains how the water sort of gathers together um, when we have absorbed it through the roots, but it doesn't explain how it's able um, to then move its way up the plant. And so it's just chemistry at this point. Um, the reason it's able to move up the plant is because uh, primarily of adhesion, but also due to a property called capillary action. And so capillary action um, refers to um, the ability of a, usually a polar um, liquid, to travel up um, through a narrow chamber using adhesion. And so adhesion, then, um, the other relevant component um, or related uh, property to, uh, to cohesion, is when water droplets are able to stick to other substances. So cohesion, they're able to stick to each other. Adhesion, they're able to stick to other stuff. And so I remember adhesion by thinking like, to adhere, 
Um, so to adhere to something is like to stick, think like adhesive, right? Like something sticky. And so in this case, the water droplets are sort of coming together and then they're sticking to uh, the internal walls of the plant tissue. And then through the capillary action, this is making them able to be pulled up. And so this process just continues um, the entire time. And so water has diffused into the xylem tissue and now it's just using capillary action, cohesion and adhesion to travel its way up to deliver that water to the rest of the plant above ground until eventually um, the stomata maintain the homeostasis and the water balance of the plant um, by evaporating the excess through the stoma. And so that explains how we move water throughout the, um, throughout the plant. Um, but the way that we, the way that we move um, solutes throughout the plant is a little bit different and it relies on this, um, it relies on this mechanism that we call the pressure flow model. And so essentially what's happening here is transpiration is going to move the water um, upwards through the xylem tissue. And then adjacent to the xylem tissue is going to be the phloem tissue. And so um, we call these sometimes like sieve tubes. And so what's happening here is um, osmosis is going to uh, move this water over here to our phloem tissue. And the reason it's doing this is because over here, we don't really have any solutes. It's a very low concentration um, over here in the xylem. There, there might be some. There, there, I mean, it, they're not pictured here, but in reality, there might be, you know, some tissue, uh, some solutes present within the xylem tissue. Um, but so the, the osmosis is going to move some of that water over to the phloem because over here, it's much, much more highly concentrated with solutes. And the reason it's more highly concentrated with solutes is because what we call source cells. And so a source cell, um, we can think of it as being like the resource for sugar or like the supplier of sugars. So these are your photosynthetic cells. So these are going to be all of your green cells, chlorophyll containing cells um, at the surface. These might uh, be your leaves, for example. And they're going to be hard at work photosynthesizing um, and storing and stockpiling um, these sugars within their cells, which will then uh, diffuse into the phloem tissue. Water from the xylem comes over to the, the phloem tissue, and then there's an increase in water pressure from the um, diffusion uh, from the xylem, and this forces the water uh, now mixed up with the sugars from the source cells to move downwards um, through the phloem. And so it keeps moving down until it is ultimately deposited in what we call a sink cell. And so a sink cell is like your repository for sugars. Um, so it's pictured here as a fruit because this is often um, what's happening. Fruit is produced in, or uh, sugar is produced in the leaves. Um, water from the xylem comes on over to the phloem, forces uh, that sugar containing the water downwards um, until it gets deposited in the sink cell. And if we think about this, um, it intuitively may make sense also. If we've ever been to like an apple orchard, for example, picture um, how the fruit grows on the trees. The leaves are generally always above the plant from which they are connected. And so we have the leaves here, a little stem, and then the fruit. And the fruit is sweet because it is storing all of those sugars um, that have been produced by the source cells or by the leaves. And so that's all very good, um, but that doesn't explain anything about mineral uptake. I mean, the good news is it's a little bit less involved, um, at least, well, it's not less involved actually, but the way we are going to learn it is less involved um, than water uptake. 
So mostly we are uh, mostly we are getting minerals into the plant um, by diffusion into the root. And so, and then transpiration, the same process we just looked at, is going to um, sort of mix up those nutrients and minerals and uh, distribute them to the rest of the plant um, that way. Um, so bringing them upwards through the surface. Now plants really need um, nitrogen. They really, really need nitrogen in order to focus. It's super important for them. Um, the, and the good news is there's a lot of um, nitrogen in our atmosphere. It exists in a gaseous form. That's what this little G in parentheses means. The downside is it's not bioavailable, meaning it cannot be utilized by a biological system. And so the workaround for this is actually um, bacteria. So we have a there's a lot of you know there's a lot of germs in the soil, um, non pathogenic for almost the, almost entirely. Um, so don't worry about you know getting sick from hanging out in the dirt. But um, we have all these bacteria and microorganisms in the in the soil surrounding the roots, um, what we call the rhizosphere. So surrounding the roots, we say that's the rhizosphere sphere. And so their job, one of their jobs, is to um, do this process that we call nitrogen fixation. They have to fix the nitrogen um, in order to make it bioavailable for the plants so that it can be uptaken. And so this is what that looks like. So this is kind of a lot. So we'll, we'll kind of, we'll start over here and then we'll walk through this. So nitrogen fixation refers to the process by which we convert nitrogen gas, so atmospheric nitrogen, N2, um, two atoms of nitrogen. Um, and then essentially we perform a chemical reaction that binds a third nitrogen to that to form ammonia. And so you, you may, if you're looking ahead, you may see that there is other stuff over here also. We'll get there in just a moment. This can be done by um, bacteria that are living in the soil, um, but it can also be done by these um, by bacteria that are actually living uh, in direct symbiosis with uh, certain plant species like legumes. So like peas and beans, um, peanuts actually, um, they generally will develop on their roots these like little nodules. And these nodules are actually full of bacteria. It's kind of like the plant's own microbiome. It's really cool. And so these plants are, uh, these plants have these nodules with the bacteria and their whole job is to fix nitrogen for the plant. So these plants are able to grow really, really well because they have their own supply of nitrogen uh, fixing bacteria right there. And so if you've ever grown peas or beans on your own, um, it's possible that you may have purchased um, something called mycorrhizal uh, inoculant, which is basically um, a bacterial culture for your soil to give uh, your plants access to these nitrogen fixing species um, if they, they may not have had that already if you used like store-bought potting soil or something. And so things that plants can use, so we've, just, we've established they can't use um, atmospheric nitrogen, they can't use N2, um, so things they can use are um, nitrates, nitrites, um, ammonia and ammonium. And so these all sound very similar. If you've taken chemistry, you may recognize some of the nomenclature there. Um, luckily for you, it's not important right now. Um, nitrates are going to be that NO3 minus, um, and then nitrites are NO2 minus. Ammonia, we said, is, um, is NH3, and um, ammonium is going to be, it looks like I've got a little typo here. I wrote NO4 plus, but what I actually meant um, was NH4 plus. And so what's happening here in this diagram, I'm just going to move me up a little bit. Um, so what's happening here in this diagram is we have atmospheric nitrogen, right? And then she is diffusing into the soil. From here, there's a couple of different pathways. So the nitrogen is diffused into the soil, um, and then 
if you know the plant is fortunate enough to have its own nitrogen fixing bacteria in its root nodules then the the bacteria that live there are going to convert that nitrogen to bioavailable forms um, for use of that plant and the cycle continues this way if not um, then that diffused nitrogen um, will reach these um, native nitrogen fixing soil bacteria and they and they will uh, use a metabolic process um, called ammonification. And so it's just like it sounds, they are going to create ammonium. From there, different species of bacteria will, uh, will then undergo another metabolic process where they take that ammonia and then they undergo what we call nitrification. So they are converting the ammonium to nitrites. And then you guessed it, another species of bacteria is going to come in and they are going to convert the nitrites to nitrates. And once we reach this, this spot, the nitrates, now we have another crossroads, we have another fork in the road. And so the nitrates can go on to um, the process of assimilation where they can be taken up by uh, plants, they can, and then the plants can feed the animals. The animals create waste, um, generally in the form of feces, or um, perhaps they, they die and their um, remains decompose. And then all of their nutrients um, get sent to the decomposers, um, whose job it is to break those molecules down into uh, ammonium. So the, the plant, or sorry, the plant feeds the animal and the animal uh, either dies or produces waste in some other way. And then that waste goes to the decomposers who use it to create ammonium where it can re-enter the cycle. If this part doesn't happen, or if maybe only it happens to part of it, um, the remaining nitrite, nitrates um, will go off to another species of bacteria that we call denitrifying bacteria. And so their job is actually to take the nitrates and convert it back to atmospheric nitrogen, um, thus completing the cycle. And so this is all pretty cool because it starts to give us a sense of what's happening sort of beneath the surface of, um, of plant life. And so I mentioned the rhizosphere um, a couple of slides ago. Um, and the rhizosphere, again, is going to be um, the surrounding area of the roots. And so um, this is all the soil, all the microorganisms, all the chemical interactions that are happening sort of in direct proximity um, in and around the plant's roots. And this is important, um, one, because it helps you know, the plant sort of take care of its metabolic needs through um, interacting with like uh, nitrifying um, bacteria and stuff like that, but it's also important because this is one way that plants communicate to each other. The rhizosphere is useful because the surrounding soil contains molecules um, that the plant has secreted. And so if another organism, or um, perhaps a neighboring plant picks up on those molecules, that molecule could be a message from the adjacent plant. Um, in the case of like certain berry species, for example, they all seem to ripen at the same time. You have many bushes near each other and they all seem to start ripening at the same time. And one of these, one of the reasons for that is because the plant is sending out signaling molecules through that rhizosphere that is saying, okay, things are looking pretty good over here, time to start ripening. The other way that plants are able to communicate with each other is through what we call VOCs or volatile organic compounds. Um, so these are like aromatic or odorous compounds um, that you know, we can usually detect, but also other organisms are able to detect. And so this would be like an example would be terpenes and Christmas trees, that like piney smell that we associate with like Christmas trees. 
um, and the smell of cut grass. So you may have heard there was this like famous article that came out a couple of years ago now that discussed how when plants, uh, sorry, when grass specifically is being cut, that like fresh cut grass smell that maybe we either really like or maybe we're just really allergic to and it actually kind of sucks to, you know, experience, um, that smell is actually a, a VOC released by the grass that essentially communicates to other grass, hey, we're being murdered over here. That would be cool if that stopped. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's grass, so I don't really know how the plant responds to that. But this is, you know, it, even so, this is really interesting because we don't think of plants as being able to communicate. They don't um, relay messaging to each other in a way that we as humans can relate to. But that doesn't mean that they're not living and that doesn't mean that they're not um, communicating with each other. And so it's not even just that they're communicating with each other, really. They're also using these mechanisms to communicate with other organisms that they interact with. So. Uh, soil bacteria can pick up on these signals potentially. Um, pollinating plants can pick up on these signals potentially. These really nice um, fragrances from flowers that you know we as humans enjoy can be detected um, by pollinators like birds and bats and bees and butterflies, right? Um, and so, you know, it may draw, it may play a role in drawing these organisms towards the plant. And so, it may be that it's an, that these fragrances, these VOCs, are um, are evolutionary uh, mechanisms to attract pollinators and therefore um, perpetuate the reproduction of their species. And so that's what I've got for you today. I know that was really, really long. I'm super sorry um, for both taking up a ton of your time um, and also for um, not being able to have a video on uh, Tuesday. I was having some, some difficulties then, um, but I hope you found this helpful. Um, I know that was a lot of information. If you have any questions, um, please let me know, shoot me an email, um, schedule a conference, show up to conference period, whatever makes sense. Um, and I will talk to you soon.